Hi, and welcome to PhD at Living. Today is part five of our beer discussion where we talk about head, the frothy, foamy goodness on top of the beer when you pour it. Why does it form and where does it come from? Well, I honestly don't know, so that's the end of the video. See you next time. I'm kidding, come on! Much like soda, many beers are carbonated. That is, they have carbon dioxide, CO2, dissolved in them. Part of that CO2 comes from the natural reaction of the yeast with the glucose to create ethanol. The decarboxylation of the pyruvate from the thing, the reaction mechanism that we showed in the last video. You really should watch all of these in order. What are you doing? Another piece of it, exact same reaction, is added just before bottling in the form of what's called a priming sugar to give just a little bit more carbon dioxide there. Chemically, this whole thing relates to the principle in Henry's Law, which relates the solubility of a compound to the pressure. Because the beer pressurizes as more carbon dioxide is built up after bottling, more of that CO2 is dissolved, the solubility increases. When you open that beer, you hear that wonderful tss because that's the carbon dioxide coming to an equilibrium atmospheric pressure, the solubility goes down, hence the CO2 evolves from the bottle. How about that? For more info on that Henry's Law thing, check out my scuba diving video. Because if there's two things that absolutely go together, it is drinking and underwater activities. Chemically, the addition of carbon dioxide does two critical things. The first is the reaction of carbon dioxide with water to create carbonic acid. Let's step through that one. This is the sort of mechanism that lends itself really well to my meager organic chemistry abilities. If you look at carbon dioxide, we have partial negatives and partial positives based on the electronegativities of the carbon and the oxygen. The oxygen wants those electrons more, so each of them get partial negatives while the carbon gets a partial positive. If we then look at the water, we can see sort of the same thing. That oxygen, especially because it has those two lone pairs, really wants the electrons more than the hydrogens do, so it gets a partial negative while the hydrogens get a partial positive. How this all works in the reaction is that negatives like positives, opposites attract, kind of like the other ends of a magnet. You get this very nucleophilic, meaning it wants the positive charge, oxygen stuff. It wants to come in here and attack the carbon because it's partially positive charged, which kicks another electron over here to the oxygen, and we'll clean this up. Which leaves us with this intermediate here. It's not great because we have a fully positive oxygen with too many bonds and an oxygen over here with too few bonds and a negative charge. What happens is the oxygen comes over here and picks off the hydrogen from that positively charged oxygen. The hydrogen's electrons go back over to the oxygen, leaving us carbonic acid. Everybody's formal charges are square and the atoms are all satisfied with where they are. Carbonic acid, much like acetic acid slash vinegar and citric acid, go figure, has somewhat of an acidic taste to it. This is why your carbonated beers have that ever so slight bite to them. Keep in mind that not all of the CO2 in the beer reacts with the water to create carbonic acid. There's some equilibrium going on here and there's some residual CO2 left over to create that carbonation in all the fizzy bubbles. The second thing carbon dioxide has going for it is its solubility in water. Yeah, I know, beer is ethanol and stuff, but unless you have a really hard-hitting beer, we're talking like 6 to 8% ethanol, so it's still majority water. That solubility allows us to put a decent amount of the carbon dioxide into the beer. The process of bubble creation is one of nucleation and propagation. Loosely defined, the nucleation is kind of just the creation of a bubble from somewhere. Now once we have that bubble, that bubble then is the nucleation site, the creation point for other bubbles, which is where we get our propagation. One bubble creates more bubbles, those bubbles create bubbles themselves, etc, etc, etc. Now we have our foam. This is what happens when you pour the beer out of its bottle into a glass. You get a nucleation site for the small bubble creation, the small bubbles create other bubbles from the propagation and you get your head. This is also why if you pour the bottle too quickly you get way too much nucleation, way too much propagation, and Mount Vesuvius flow over. Side note, this brings up an interesting point about glassware. Imperfections in the walls of the glass are not big enough to cause the nucleation propagation of the bubbles, so it has to come from somewhere else. This is why if you see one of those cool Sam Adams glasses with the etched ring in the bottom, that's to create the nucleation site for those bubbles to propagate and give you that wonderful foam. Well great, I've got my head on my beer and everything is nice, but in a carbonated beer that head sure goes away really quickly. Why is that? Well, it's a process called Oswald ripening. According to Wikipedia, Oswald ripening is an observed phenomenon in solid solutions or liquid salts that describes the change of an inhomogeneous structure over time, i.e. small crystals or salt particles dissolve and redeposit onto larger crystals or salt particles. Huh? Let's break it down. 
A small bubble tends to have a higher pressure and higher surface tension because the degree of curvature in the bubble is higher. Therefore, two smaller bubbles via Ostwald ripening will want to become one larger bubble, thereby reducing the pressure and the surface tension and moving it into a lower energy state. If I then take two medium-sized bubbles, they will want to become one giant bubble. This is where the solubility of the carbon dioxide in the water kind of works against us. While we can make that head very quickly, quickly due to that solubility coming out, the Ostwald ripening means our small bubbles in that head want to become big bubbles really fast and tend to do so. This is why your $3 boot of Old German at the local pub has a pretty decent head when it comes out, but within like a minute or two it's basically gone. One of the coolest things I have ever seen in my life is from Discovery Channel's Moonshiners. An old shiner can shake a mason jar white dog and proof that puppy with an incredible degree of accuracy. We're talking matching a hydrometer, which is a device used to measure the density of a solution. Because water has one density and ethanol has a different density, mixtures of the two have a density, you guessed it, somewhere in the middle. When shaken, a high ethanol solution tends to have bigger bubbles that dissipate quickly. Whereas in a high water solution, the solution gives smaller bubbles that hang around for a while. All of this bubble creation and lingering and dissipation sure sounds similar to what we're talking about, and as it turns out, all of it is a direct function of Ostwald ripening. And that's the chemistry of beer head. Carbonation, Ostwald ripening, etc. Next time we're going to talk about the other side of that coin with nitrogenation and nitro beers. But that's for then, and this is for now. See you next time. I think a man working outdoors feels more like a man if he can have a bottle of suds. It's only my opinion, sir.